On this episode, I'm very serious in my new office. You ask questions and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary B. This is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 220 of the Ask Gary V Show. This will be a trivia question one day. Which episode was the first episode in our new headquarters? And you know what? We don't edit that often. Like, but like, let's get some B-roll from somebody, Stefan, to at least, even if it's like social media or phone B-roll, why don't you chop up a little bit here? Show people a little bit around the office. I'm sure I'll make Daily V. How many Daily V? Are we, we're only one Daily V behind, right? You're editing one. Oh you're, you're one. You're editing 57. No, uh, Tyler. Uh, fine. Uh, whoever. But we. I don't mean you. This is not a. Uh, 57's being edited. Yeah. So this will be 58. Yes. Will be the new office. Got it. Okay. India. What are your opening remarks to our new office? It's fucking amazing. Wow. It's beautiful. India cursed. And you know it's awesome. It's really amazing. D Rock, can you show a little bit real quick? I don't know how like it's got right into the light. I don't know how. Yeah. Oh, very much. Sorry, you fancy. Overcast. <laughs> Overcast helps. Overcast good. Got it. I see the garden, which is exciting. It looks like uh, there's a new show. It's really exciting. It's been a great day. Seems like uh, all the Vayner peeps are very happy. It makes me very happy. People are like, are you overwhelmed? Are you happy? The truth is, I'm not. You know, uh, you know, not to be cool because that's not where it's coming from. I don't celebrate things, as you guys know. Like, I don't see this as like, woo. Like, I'm, uh, I'm pumped for everybody, though. People have space. People are not sitting in closets. The, the cafeteria, the kitchen is insane. People got a proper breakfast, sat the down. Yeah, the yeah there's the seltzer machine. It's crazy. You love it, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of fun stuff on this floor and a half. A lot of people. Um, I love that people are walking by me quite a bit, which is exciting. I get to see a lot more people. Um, Vinny, looking good. Let's go. So uh, yeah, good day. Super pumped. Kind of zenned out. Actually, my energy is lower because I'm in like focus zone of like getting everything right. But I'm excited about the show. Doing a double header today because we have Luis from Million Dollar Listings coming in a little bit. He uh, saw Frederick and he said, I gotta be on as well, so we'll see him later. But I didn't want the first episode back to be a guest. I wanted it to be a pure episode and so India, uh, this doesn't roll. Really yeah. <laughs> I need a rolling chair for this office. Are you ready? I'm ready. To get into? The? Show. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we killed it. I love it. Look at this Pele sign. Why do I have like a Pele sign jersey just like flapping around? We need to get this frame. You need to do like, not people do I need to hang, Alex had a great idea that I can hang the jerseys from the rafters like they're retired. So, all right, I'm ready India. I'm ready. (laughs) Okay, from Broden. Broden? Yeah, you emailed me his question and you wanted to answer it. Okay. Um, Being a brand. Broden asks, being a brand new YouTube channel, what do you suggest people do in order to accumulate more subscribers and views? Anything absolutely necessary or does it all just come down to patience? I wanted to answer this because I thought this would bring a lot of people value. There's so many of you that hear patience and then you just think, okay, let me just continue to make shows and content and you're gonna wake up four years later going from 85 subscribers to 219 and I don't wanna be on the hook for wasting your time. You have to understand and I talk about this a lot and you guys hear it from me a lot actually, a lot of the homies that are sitting out there, distribution. Distribution is the game and so what you do when you have 85 uh, you know, people following your channel or 200 or even 2,000 or even 20,000 or even 200,000 um, is you need to understand that you need to keep hustling for your awareness. Of course, and just so everybody knows this, of course your show has to be good. You have to continue to make your craft strong. You have to continue to be interesting. You have to continue to bring value and produce good content. But you need people to know about it. And so I think one reason I've always done well is I understood that. And so one of the great ways to do that is collaborations. I think if you've got a YouTube channel, you need to basically reach out to, I don't know, the other 7,000 people that are in your genre and reach out to them and see if you can bring them value, right? Horace, you love UFC, you decide to start a channel, you need to reach out to the 40,000 UFC channels and be like, hey, you know, I'm in the network, 
So I go to gyms, I can get you original content, can you put me on your show to bring me value for my show? When you have 44 viewers, you can't offer somebody who has 400,000 viewers, let's trade, you'll be on my show, I'll be on your show. You get laughed out of the room and people do that. That's not the way you're gonna win, that's not 5149. What you can offer is something in return. What you can offer is access because you're in those gyms with original content so maybe you can be doing on location interviewing for that big UFC thing and then you know, and for yourself too and then that put person puts you on. You can offer money if you've got it, that's fine. I mean whatever it is, so it's about distribution. So collaborations with other YouTube shows for sure, social media through and through, creating enormous amounts of content. I've been spending even more time paying attention to how people are building organic followings on Instagram and hashtag culture really works. For the people that are really patient, you know, and, and I ebb and flow with my hashtag work. Dunk, you do a good job with me on Musical.ly. You're like, this is the one that works. Like just, you know, I, I, I would even argue that I'm being lazy with my hashtag work in Instagram for sure but for a lot of you, you have to go down that route. It really, really, really works. And then reverse engineering content creation. Let me explain. As we speak right now, I have a video going viral. It's called August. I made it so we could run it on August 1st. Producing content that you know has a chance of going somewhere based on when you make it. A Monday morning rant that you post on Monday morning. Making relevant content to what's going on in the world, either in pop culture, you know, your thoughts on what Miley Cyrus did on Wrecking Ball, or the Kanye and Taylor Swift, Kim and Taylor Swift fight, or, or the Olympics starting. Making content that's relevant, that gives it a little bit of legs for shareability, is very important from the content creation. Look, there's only two things, the content and distribution. And so whether it's becoming a part of forums around UFC, I keep using hers, you know, like become a member of, of forums, become a member of Facebook groups. Most of you are not hustling distribution. You're focusing on the content and you think magically if you keep patient and you keep doing it, something's gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen. For four of you, all time, once, for four of you a year, something's gonna happen. That little motivational kid, right? The Jamaican trainer kid that went viral over the weekend? Somebody clearly posted that video and it started the process. It's great content. Like that's clearly content that's got a shot. But he's been putting out content for a little while. This is not his first rodeo. And so yes, it happens, right? Yes, it happens. But it's far more interesting for you to take control of your distribution through collaborations, through proper hashtag distribution on the Instagram world, from reaching out, biz deving, reaching out, being part of forums and other internet communities like Facebook groups to become part of that community so when you put out stuff people want to support you. I would tell you with Wine Library TV, I spent 20 minutes making the video and I spent five hours creating the distribution a day. That's a great way to end that because that's, that's the answer. Thank you. I'm Shauna. Okay. Hey Gary, congratulations on two years of a successful show. I just love it, I watch it all the time and uh, get all sorts of great advice from you. Uh, my name is Shauna, I'm from hastenhustle.com and I just wanted to um, ask you a quick question. Um, my question is, when you're at the beginning of your business or I guess at any time of your business, uh, how, how do you know how much risk is too much risk? and uh, when to kind of pull back. Sean, I've got Thanks a really, again, bye. No, no worries, thank you. Sean, I've got a really good answer for this. Um, I believe that risk is a very interesting thing uh, and I've got a pretty good career with it and I would tell you here's what mine looks like. I risk as much as I'm willing to completely lose and I push it as far as possible and that's always my model. That if all goes to zero on this move, can I still be breathing and stay alive? Anything that would put me out of business put me out of business and people do that. They borrow too much money, they, they dilute themselves in the company that could make them lose control from the board. Anything that would put me at risk, um, I, uh, I stay away from. So the, the punchline is very simply, I'm willing to lose every penny other than the first penny that I need to breathe. All of it. I'm willing to lose, you know, we do things here all the time, Vayner, uh, where I invest and buy things, buy companies, buy, you hire people um, and uh, the number's always got to be if it goes to dead zero, will I still be alive to fight another day? But I take it right to that edge. And really not like to like the penny, probably to the million dollars on a hundred million dollar business, the one person, you know, just some little nest egg. But uh, I think I'm stunned by people that take risk that actually puts them out. Floyd Mayweather doesn't take any risks like that as a boxer. That's why he's undefeated. Yeah. 
Sean. What's up, Gary? It's Sean from Denver here at the top of Mount Evans, 14,000 foot plus mountain here. I got a question for you about breaking into new accounts. What's your recommendation? Do you recommend starting high and then going low or low and then going high? Does it depend on the, depend on the size of the account, small or large? Would love your advice and insight. Thanks so much. Um, I always think it's a lot easier to go lower than it is to go higher. So if, again, if you need an account more than anything in the world to stay alive, you go in low. You do what you have to do to stay alive. But if you have the luxury of, I don't need this thousand bucks, and, but I want this client, I wanna grow, but I don't need. Want and need are two very different things. Um, then I would go higher. You can always go down, uh, you can never go up. Hey, I want $3,000 a month for this. Great, no, actually 5,000. Not so easy. Hey, I want $3,000 a month for this. Nah. All right, 2,500. So, you know, to me, to me, it's just always better to go higher. Um, or what I tend to do, to be very frank with you, which is an interesting negotiating move, I tend to go the number. I tend to go, it's five, with Vayner, when we started, it's $5,000 a month. And people are like, I don't wanna pay, we wanna go 4,000, because maybe they thought I was going higher, and I said no. And it was a very important thing to have that leverage to not negotiate down. And so, we walked away from things, we didn't do things, uh, which sucked at times, but um, it definitely created a reputation in the marketplace that I wasn't over-evaluating stuff, and it was the number. So to me, it's higher or the number, um, you know, when I do trades, I go higher. Actually, cut that part. I don't want the guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move forward. <laughs> From Eric. Eric. Eric asks, when looking for a new job, do you think it's a bad idea to give your boss a heads up before receiving job offers so they can prepare for your departure? I think that's every single person. You know, that's a tough question, a very smart question. Um, to me, I wouldn't tell them. I, I just think it's a survival of the fittest kind of thing. Like, if you think it's a vulnerability that you're not gonna be able to find, it, like, I just don't, that, to me, that's the risk thing. I just wouldn't do that because if they reacted poorly even after five years, thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's very nice. Thanks, Tyler, it made it. Um, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I wouldn't do that because that could get you to zero. And I, you know, don't forget, they fire you on the spot, then you start taking a job that you don't necessarily want just to pay, and now you're in a two-year cycle of having crappy job. Like, it could turn into a whirlwind. Now, if your moral compass is going off inside like crazy and you can't sleep at night, then do you. Like, I just think everybody's different. To me, doing the right thing is always the right thing. If for you that's the right thing, then that's fine, but, but make sure that's the right thing for you, not the way your mom sees the world or your friends or, or anybody else, like it, that has to be your decision. Um, and, it, and if you're okay with the consequences, I'm okay with the consequences of speaking the way I speak, meaning I leave lots of money on the table for cursing. I'm okay with that. Um, you have to be okay with the consequences. I hate people that are ideological and then when they have to face the consequences, they regret. You know, like it's the right thing, what, what's the name? It's Eric. Eric, it's the right thing to do, sounds good on paper, if it's truly the right thing to do for you, then great, then do it. But if it's not, and then you get fired, and then you don't have another job, and who, what, you showed a couple people you're a good guy? Like, I think a lot of people front. So? Interesting. Yeah. It's actually not what I expected. Mm. You expect me to say, yes, yeah, say it? Yeah, I don't I, yeah, It's easy for me to say, though, right? Yeah. Like, like I, by the way, I wouldn't do it, India. Yeah. And, and I, people don't do it here all the time. Like, I know, I know two people right now that are actively on the way of going out. And I don't, I'm not mad at them, I get it. Like, they're pretty, well, like, you know, I'm not paying their mortgage, I'm not feeding their family. Um, you know, businesses, businesses, uh, businesses fire. Like, like, you know, like, right? So, I don't know, like, I get it, and like, it's a, like, but I'm giving the real answer here. And I think that everybody's different. But I definitely would not tell my boss. I would work on it, get the job, and then, I would go, and I, and I, that's why I'm not a hypocrite. I never get mad when people do that here. I understand, you know? I mean, it's scary. You know how many people are living in this crazy big city that we can now see, and uh, it's expensive, and they're on their own, and their parents couldn't help them, and you know, like, that's scary. And then what I really get sad is, people have done that here. People have quit without having a job, not for that reason, but for different reasons, and then they go into a crappy job because they're just scared. Like, they've held off for a couple months, but now they get really scared and they take anything. And then they're like, in a, they're like two years step back, you know? Yeah. All right. Last one. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. Okay. 
Hi, what's up, Gary V? Kevin Widow at K Widopia on Twitter here at the Masai Mara, Kenya's world famous safari destination, here with the Lions. My question this week is in a market such as this, even here, everybody has a smartphone, huge smartphone penetration, twinned with uh, very early stage social media uh, development and promotion. What type of content driven online business would you advise to set up? Thanks very much. Question, you know, I don't know the, the uh, market in Africa and Asia as well as I do the rest of the world, but I'm very aware of the um, phone penetration, payment through phones, lack of, did you see that? Yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> Something just dripped. Oh, oh the pipe. The pipe. Uh, yeah. From my pipe. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That was so cool. Um, did you see that? You know about that? They're gonna fix it? Eventually. Um, <laughs> I would say that I would reverse engineer the audience. So what I would do is I would spend months in the African market, um, figure out what people want to buy, and I would start an online business that worked in the US or Europe that's around psychology, not just because it was the US or Europe. Certain things are tried and true human, certain things are contextual to the neighborhood, the country, the cadence, the pulse, the slang of a marketplace. So I would use my best of ability of understanding what's human, what's innately human, uh, e-commerce, you know, buying stuff, water needs, whatever, you know, whatever it may be, whatever the market's interested in and try to build around that. So to me, it's understanding the users with those phones, what they're doing. I would look at what they're doing now, whether it's gaming or music downloading or things of that nature, and then try to project what needs do they have that they're doing in a traditional way that the phone could solve. And I would look at the progressive phone markets in Asia and the US to see where they're two or three years ahead. I think a lot of people have looked at the US market and, and have tried to replicate that in their market. And some have been very successful and some have not. And I think some things are inherently US centric and I think some things are human centric and that's what you need to decode. And I think I've done well with that in social networks. Some things are just human based. Like if you get a big enough group of people, they'll drag other people into it, Snapchat. That's why those are easy for me to predict. Great, very serious show. I wonder if I'm gonna be serious when it's cloudy like today. Mm-hmm. And more, I wonder if the weather's gonna dictate, that'll be a funny data point. But it will. Yeah. Question of the day. What should we ask, what question should we ask? India, you asked the question of the day. Um, question of the day. Do you think the weather is going to affect Gary's mood? <laughs> oh, but we're entering jet season. Oh, the jet season is coming. You keep asking questions. I'll keep answering them.